one of the conclusions it's reached is that there should be an additional secondary objective for the PRA around sustainable growth and international competitiveness um, to, to, to encourage both of those aspects. And that is um, that uh, that will complement um, the, uh, the primary objective of the PRA, which we mentioned is consistent with one of the objectives of the Solvent Institute Review, which is um, protection of policyholders and the safety and soundness of firms. You're listening to Rethinking Insurance, a podcast series from WTW, where we discuss the issues facing PNC, life, and composite insurers around the globe, as well as exploring the latest tools, techniques, and innovations that will help you rethink insurance. Hello, and welcome to Rethinking Insurance. I'm your host, Sina Team, and today I'm delighted to be joined by my guests, Kenny McIver and Anthony Plotnick. Welcome both. Thanks, Sina. Great to be nice. here. Hi, Sina. Thank, thank you for welcoming us along. Um, in episode six of this podcast series, I spoke to Mary Kotashka about the proposed changes to Solvency 2 for European insurers. And uh, we also touched a bit of, um, upon the solvency regime in Europe, diverging from the one in the UK. So in today's episode, we'll focus on proposed reforms to Solvency 2 in the UK, as set out by the HM Treasury and the Prudential Regulation Authority, um, the PRA. Kenny, you're a director in Willis Watson's insurance consulting and technology business with a focus on the bulk purchase annuity market in the UK. And Anthony, you're a director in our insurance investments team and you lead the private asset proxy. I think prior to joining Willis Hoss Watson, you've been at Kilter Finance, Just Group, Canada Life, and EY, and have worked at or consulted life insurers for roughly 17 years. If you've listened to this podcast before, then you know that I start by Googling my guests' names. So, Kenny, there mm. is a Kenny McIver who is a sport injury therapist in Scotland. <laughs> and I've also found a YouTube video by Kenny McIver in which he's reviewing a kebab place in Glasgow. Is uh, mm. this the sort of result you wish one would find when Googling your name? Um, I'm aware of the sports therapist, but I don't know about the, the gourmet kebab reviewer. That could possibly <laughs> be me, I, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> it does look remarkably similar, actually. <laughs> okay. And Anthony, you. your name seems to be very unique, actually. Um, I could only see actual search results, uh, an empty Pinterest page, an empty SoundCloud page with your name. Uh, but I think Google knows that you're playing squash. Uh, so would that have been your alternative career choice if the actual path hadn't worked out? Um, I mean, I'm not, not sure how lucrative squash is. It hasn't yet even made the Olympics, but, but perhaps <laughs> another sport like tennis was in, in my junior days. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you are an actuary then. So on the 28th of April, 2022, HM Treasury released its consultation on the 72 reforms package. And this was accompanied by a discussion paper from the PRA. And you both spent quite a considerable amount of time investigating the key aspects of the current and the proposed regimes. And you described your analysis in an analytical report, which was published on the 21st of July this year and which is available online. Maybe, Kenny, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, no, absolutely, of course. Um, so, yeah, we published that on the 21st of July, and, um, and it's been a very important um, contribution, we, we hope, to the, to the discussion. Um, this was working alongside um, the Association of British Insurers in the UK. Um, I, I'd probably be interested in going a little bit further back, just to give it more context, uh, particularly since you mer mentioned Merrick's, Merrick's uh, description of the, the European process, so, uh, or at least your podcast with him. What, um, what what happened here in the UK is in, in October 2020, um, UK Treasury kicked off a review, a call for evidence, as it were, on Solvency 2, looking at many ways to, to improve it uh, following the withdrawal from the EU. Now, <clears throat> shortly following that, there was a, a quantitative impact study, a, a quiz, um, which we're all familiar with, uh, we're all familiar with through the, the Solvency II process many years ago. Um, that was um, a quiz conducted by the UK's regulator, the PRA, um, looking at um, ex scenarios that, to, to gather data for the future reforms. Um, now, the quiz had two key, key areas of focus, which was the risk margin and the matching adjustment. Hence, um, our work and, and indeed the analytical report you referred to are very much focused on, on those two areas. Um, uh, and, and of course, very, very much focused on, on their implications for the UK and the UK business, which um, 
uh, for those those two concepts very very important to uh, a new IT business in the UK um, and there's a very growing market there in bulk purchase annuity the area uh, I work in uh, a lot these days and that is um, that is where um, business uh, annuity business is coming through from the, the the pension regulatory environment into the insurance environment and that's an area of significant growth so a really really key um, segment of the market. We produced a first report that went into the public domain on the quiz. So we gathered the quiz data um, from from um, the life insurers who submitted to the PRA's quiz, and we we um, we analysed that and presented it back to the industry. I believe that was a very helpful contribution to see what was coming out on aggregate. Uh, we also supplemented that with with uh, our own our own analyses on representative portfolios and, um, and 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 sort of giving some discussion about what was potentially coming through from what we're seeing in the quiz. And there were some serious concerns on behalf of industry back then. Our analytical report um, goes takes that further. It's now following what you mentioned, Sina, which was the additional um, reforms that were set out. Um, we. There was, in fact, a new uh, proposal uh, that went a different direction from where the quiz went uh, on the on on one key area of the of the matching adjustment. So the design of the fundamental spread um, had, had had evolved. Um, so we we spent um, a considerable amount of that analytical report looking at that and what that meant for assets and um, and the industry more generally. We set out our um, summary of the results. Um, to follow how well the proposed reforms could be meeting Treasury's free objectives, which came in that call for evidence I mentioned earlier. Now, um, those were around, um, firstly, the area of international competitiveness for the UK is insurance market. It was about, and the second was about protection of policyholders and safety of firms, um, which also happens to be the, the regulator's primary objective. Um, so obviously a very interesting one for the PRA in particular. And the third Treasury objective was to support firms to provide long term capital to drive growth in the UK. Now, um, w there were some serious concerns around how well um, those would be meeting the objective. In particular, there was uh, we were seeing um, winners and losers emerging from the proposals. So Anthony, it's it's the 17th of August today, and I think things are quite fluid. Um, so as of today, what do you see as the key implications emerging from the current direction of travel? Yeah, no, that's obviously a very good good question. And um, you know, if you go back to you know what were the objectives of of Solvency II reform, so Kenny outlined the objectives, but but primarily. Um, you know, the government is looking, you know, really for a release of of, of capital um, from the insurance industry that that they've, you know, talked about billions of additional funding, you know, from from the UK insurance industry and in particular um, the long term investors. So it's so those that write long term liabilities, pr primarily the the bulk annuity players, as, as Kenny described, that, that transfer you know pension risk from from defined benefit pension schemes historically in in, in the UK, you know though that the insurance industry is is seen as a gold standard uh, for, for holding those those liabilities, uh, and and when you hold those liabilities, you need to invest and, and match those liabilities in the Solvency II regime, and that's what the matching adjustment. You know, essentially, is 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 designed for it. It, it provides, you know, a way of 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 kind of capitalising the the additional liquidity or, or spread um, liquidity premium that you see in in these assets relative to you know your view of of the expected you know cost of of default um, because you're a long term investor. You hold these assets to maturity to to match and and pay the annuity liabilities and, and and therefore you know the risk you're exposed to is is default so that that's kind of what the matching adjustment you know was set up uh, in solvency 24 uh, i think you know there's there's been um in terms of the direction of travel since solvency 2 came into effect and just with the, the kind of low interest rate environment that we've had in the uk and, and across europe um for the decade um you know being moved in, in the uk into private assets um, so the, these are assets that are not publicly traded um, they, they don't have public valuations 
or, or credit ratings. So, so insurers have to develop that capability themselves, and the regulator, um, you know, is 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 concerned that you know the current matching adjustment doesn't necessarily consider these these assets. So that's that's why the the PRA, is, as the UK regulator, you know, has come up with proposals to to change the matching adjustment significantly alongside a, a reduction. Uh, 60 to 70 percent in risk margin and, and the Treasury you know when they were describing this in their consultation you know talked about an envisaged 10 to 15 percent release in, in capital across the life industry so that's where this this billions of capital is is, is viewed to come from uh, but with the PRA's proposals and, and the testing we we did of that in our report you know we're seeing you know that 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 doesn't materialize we were more more getting a neutral impact overall across the, the life industry but a negative impact for the the annuity writers so that the ones that we we would see as the the contributors to the objectives uh, around long-term investment uh, and and spurring a vibrant uh, in, in innovative uh, competitive sector um the conflict is is with the objective too around protecting policyholders and the soundness of firms. But, but again, we view that you know you know, really you need to consider both existing policyholders and and future policyholders. That's you know the future pensioners that that currently sit in in pension funds that that would transfer into the insurance regime. You know and and just you know whether we're in you know as you reach later retirement annuitizing and, and and taking a guaranteed benefit as as rates and rising again you know does that mean you know people start considering annuities more more again that that you know obviously reduced since that was no longer compulsory in the uk as part of pension reforms um that's almost 10 years ago now um, so that that chance forms that the uk market to move to more bulk annuities and that's where the the industry is is, is seeing the, the concerns but yeah it, we, we have kind of reached this i suppose standoff between you know what what the the government has set out and, and what the regulator you know is is proposing uh it, which which it says meets the objectives but within our report obviously we, we we've we've challenged some of the assumptions that that the that the regulator had put forward to say that um you effectively they met that objective but on a basis that the the transitional benefit that is is effectively the benefit that was you know, put in to to allow a smooth transition from solvency one into solvency two where in particular the annuity players in, in the uk have large transitional benefits because of the risk margin this risk margin is now being reduced but 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 the regulator wants to to offset some of some or all of that reduction essentially through through a significant change to the matching adjustment which which is more unexpected so in terms of where we we do see this going, it's 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 kind of hard to say at the moment. We're, we're in a period of political uncertainty. Uh, obviously, the the government um, you know is going through a leadership contest. Um, the industry did meet with um, the the old uh, chancellor Rishi Sunak, who is is one of the final two, uh, just before he resigned, and and set their case to, to him. But again, also we don't yet know who who moves in into the into the roles, um, you know, or how this this kind of you know potential um, you know, disagreement in in terms of where the matching adjustment goes between industry and and, and the regulator, uh, how that ends up, um, you know, is still is still pretty uncertain. Thanks, Anthony. So on that point, um, I don't know, Kenny, maybe you want to share some uh, of your thoughts as well on what the changing political landscape in the UK could mean for the reform process. Thanks, Tina. Yeah, so Solvency 2 has been raised by the leadership candidates as an issue to tackle. Um, I should point out here that we're recording this on the 17th of August, so things are um, still playing out on that contest, of course. What is important here is the, the government is a very key decision maker and it's being supported by Treasury and by the Bank of England and the regulator, uh, the PRA is part of the Bank of England um, to, to come to, a, to an, an ultimate decision on, on what is, a, is a, um, uh, the reform approach to be taken. Um, <clears throat> the, there was also, so, so in that sort of chain of command, there's, there's also, there's the Chancellor to the Exchequer, which um, uh, has a, important oversight role of this area but indeed the economic secretary to the treasury is probably the next uh, the most um key government individual uh next in line after 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 the after the from from the treasury's um connected to the treasury of course 
the the, the, the previous economic secretary to Treasury uh, did set a line in the sand shortly after the 2021 quiz that I mentioned, um, and Anthony spoke about a sort of release of capital which was being targeted. Um, that that was a, a release that they had um, they had been looking for. Um, now. The economic sector treasury, of course, at this stage is 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 yet to be uh, reappointed. Um, so, but that that will be an important decision maker. Also, industry has been make, making progress. Anthony mentioned um, the then chance that Rishi Sunak had been in conversation with uh, key senior representatives of industry on this topic, um, and that appeared to be moving forward as useful discussions for industry. But um, obviously, there's been some significant change. What is true, of course, is the regulator ultimately does need to regulate this regime and supervise it. So it does it does have an important role to play and need and will 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 ultimately have responsibility over over it. One thing that's um, that's uh, currently uncertain is when we will see back uh, the responses from the Treasury's consultation process. So the the government guideline period is 12 weeks from from the end of the the consultation. Um, that was 21 July. So we see about mid-October uh, at the end of that sort of guideline period. We suspect with the, with um, with the uncertainty on leadership and the need to, to brief and to to understand their um, position and views on this to to move ahead, uh, it, it's likely and possible actually that it will run over that 12 week 12 week period um, before we see um, clarity on on the future direction. Right. Uh, there are also more wider ranging changes afoot in the UK about how regulation is put into practice. Uh, can you summarize a bit how this will work? Yeah, thank you. So so what we're referring to here is the, is the future regulatory framework um, consultation or reviews rather that ran simultaneously to the Solvency 2 call for evidence that I mentioned before. This review is, is broader than insurance alone. It's for uh, financial services. Um, but it has very important implications for for this particular topic. Um, I'd say there's there's two ones which I should should bring out. The first is um, what the, that review has um, the, one of the, one of the conclusions it's reached is that there should be an additional secondary objective for the PRA around sustainable growth and international competitiveness um, to 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 encourage both of those aspects. And that is um, that uh, that will complement um, the uh, the primary objective of the PRA, which we mentioned, is consistent with one of the objectives of the Solvency II review, which is um, protection of policyholders and the safety and soundness of firms. And it will also add to sort of, uh, other uh, objectives of the PRA um, and, and have regards that the PRA has to work towards uh, achieving. But, and secondly, on the FRF, the other implication is, um, is and, and this is really quite kind of the, the substance of the FRF, which is moving rules um it, it, the Solvency two rules in particular into a uh, combination of legislation and the pra rule book the latter of which is designed to give more agility to the regulator um, and is also intended to be balanced with appropriate accountability and scrutiny of the regulator on on the decisions that go there but what it means is there will be that there's there's some decision to be made still about what parts uh, well, first of all, what the reforms would be, but then it will be a question of of what parts will sit with the regulator's rulebook and what parts will sit um, more firmly within legislation. So with respect to the key topics in the UK review, um, you mentioned a few uh, pieces here already. What are the different directions that UK and the European Commission are headed now? I mean, in the UK, the match adjustment topic is, is, is very key. Um, in the EU, it's only currently Spain uh, jurisdiction which has um, which has um, which has use of the matching adjustment. So, so the, the, the priorities are, are very different. It's worth bearing in mind. And even on the risk margin, the other important topic on this UK review um, that that that's um, given that the UK has a significant amount of annuity business, the risk margin on that is is very high and uh, interest rate sensitive as presently designed. So that is some of those issues on the risk margin are more pressing for the UK. So. So in the EU review, there's really no material changes proposed to the design of the matching adjustment, which is not, not a, a great surprise, given what I said earlier. On the risk margin, however, there is a, a, several considerations um, on, on that. So there was um, there there have been considerations around moving. So, so the, the, tre the direction appears to be moving towards a 
tapered cost of capital approach consistent with what uh, uh, is being considered in the UK. So there's consistency there. The calibration, of course, the strength of it is 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 a different matter. Where um, the EU is actually um, in the EU Parliament uh, report uh, in July, it, it, it's, it, that calibration has has moved down to be um, a sort of a, le a much less onerous risk margin under the calibration for the EU as compared to where um, we initially started in the UK in the quiz. But the UK is 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 intending to move more towards a 60% reduction in risk margin for long-term life insurers, which um, is not too much different from where where the U, where the EU is 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 seems to be getting in that topic. All right. Uh, so Anthony, where do we go from here? Yeah, I mean, as as we've we've kind of touched on, it's it's quite a complex issue that there's a, a number of different. You know, views around in, in particular the, the matching adjustment reforms and, and what they might do to the, the UK sector, um, you know, considering, you know, obviously the, the dampening that the, the PRA has suggested to the matching adjustment would would make the investment in, in long term assets, um, you know, perhaps um, compared to today, um, less of an incentive uh, uh, for the long term annuity writers that so doesn't obviously fit with with the, the Treasury objectives. Um, so I think that there's perhaps a few a few options that that you know might you know be considered as part of this. And you know, obviously, as Treasury go through their their period of of, of kind of understanding all, all all the responses they've received, you know, the PRA similarly had had their discussion paper and, and will have had responses to that. They're asking for further data data collection, um, you know, in particular around what this might mean. You know, to to the solvency capital requirements. So, you know, the, the discussion thus far has largely been on the the base balance sheet. But but if you change the the the, the base balance sheet, you know, by definition, it it, it may change. You know, the, the the one in two hundred level of capital you need to hold on on top of that under the, the solvency two regime. Um, so that gathering exercise would would give more information. Uh, although firms have been, you know, perhaps you know, suggesting that there's very little time over the summer to do that justice. So we're not not certain all the information that that was asked for will, will be responded to consistently you know, across across those annuity writers, dependent on what they've agreed with with supervisors directly as as might be possible over the summer. Uh, so we've got those those things to look at. But you know, do do we have something that is you know, pretty much no change from, from what we have today. You know, interest rates have moved quite considerably over the period we've we've been discussing and debating this. So, you know, the risk margins are actually, you know, significantly reduced to to what they were at year end 20 when all our, our analysis and all the quiz data was was set at year end 20, but things have changed quite considerably since year end 20. Um, so may need, you know, further, you know, analysis in a new interest rate regime and you know the Bank of England itself predicting you know a, a potentially a long recession coming so so you know again this all you know make makes it quite difficult to see how how this you know does does pan out um I suppose the second option is 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 to adopt the the kind of calibrations that, that have been put forward by the PRA but but there's clearly you know, quite a bit of reluctance to see that happen in the in in the insurance industry. So, you know, further further discussion around that, perhaps you know, around you know, in particular the capital requirements and what that might mean and what it might mean in in a changing interest rate environment as well. Uh, and then you know, potentially another option where the the the, the, the treasury or or you know, effectively government plays more of a role in 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 influencing the calibration. So it's not yet clear what sits. You know, in the powers of of the PRA as the regulator, and what would be put in legislation, you know, but but might they, you know, you know, having considered the consultation responses, look to, to to perhaps change some of the parameters, or 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 indeed change um, the approach itself. So you know, this 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 model that's been put forward in in the consultation, you know, is, isn't necessarily you know one that will be adopted. You know, they could look at alternatives that have been proposed by industry. You know, there are perhaps more extensions of the existing regime, but but somewhere around those those kind of four options, unfortunately, it's hard to hard to predict of which of the four we may be at. Um, but yeah, certainly, um, we'd hope that by October, uh, when we hear the, the the Treasury consultation response, we'll have more detail. We were originally expecting a, a PRA uh, regulator consultation following that, which was indicated as being before end of the year. Uh, whether the you know various you know elements that, that 
are kind of a bit external to this, you know, delay that. So the leadership election, the, the changing economy and, and, and kind of environment around threat of recession, uh, you know, that that could potentially move this more into into next year. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, lots of track, I think, still in, into understanding when, you know, these changes would actually you know, come into effect. Yeah, so it sounds like we'll be meeting again in the next months to continue this discussion, I think. Um, thank you so much for your time and your thoughts, uh, Kenny and Anthony. Thank you. And yeah, yeah, we'd love to speak again. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sina. Thank you for listening to this episode. And if you found this interesting, then join us on other episodes of Rethinking Insurance. Thank you for joining us for this WTW podcast featuring the latest perspectives on the intersection of people, capital, and risk. For more information, visit the Insights section of WTWCO.com.